Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. On my last video, I got this question from Mac Beave. Mac says, hi Mac, can you do a video explaining disability benefits in the US? I've heard some pretty, uh, I assume, strange stuff about them, such as you lose benefits if you have more than 2,000 in your bank account, and that disabled people often cannot get married because they would lose their benefits due to their spouse's income. The system seems designed to trap these people in instability and poverty. Thanks for the videos. They are all great. Well, thank you for that praise. Uh, and yes, I can uh, explain disability benefits in the U.S. So if we're talking about uh, cash benefits for disabled people, you basically have two benefits. You have Social Security Disability Insurance, also known as SSDI. And then you have Supplemental Security Income, which is SSI. And I think in theory you could get both sometimes, but realistically you get one or the other. And SSDI is kind of like, is the good one. It's not really good either, but <laughs> it's the better of the two. So usually you're trying to get on SSDI, that's your first crack at it. And if you can't get on SSDI, uh, then you'll get shunted over to SSI. The rule that you're talking about in your comment is an SSI rule. Um, so we'll get to that. But first, let's talk about SSDI because that's the, uh, the, the better of the two benefits and the one that you, you typically try to get on if you can. So um, SSDI is like uh, Social Security old age benefits in that in order to be eligible for it, you need to have accumulated a certain number of quarters of coverage. For the old age benefits, you need 40 quarters of coverage. For SSDI, it's a sliding scale of quarters of coverage based on your age. Um, but to take a step back, a quarter of coverage, uh, for this year at least, to get a quarter of coverage, you need to earn $1,640 over the course of the year. Your earnings get reported to the Social Security Administration. So you need to earn that much to get one quarter. You can get as many as four quarters in a year, of course, that makes sense. Um, so you to get all four quarters, you would get one thousand six hundred and forty dollars times four, right? If you if, if you can earn that much in a year, you'll get all four of the available quarters for this year, and then you'll start over next year, and you'll have to earn a certain amount next year to get one, two, three, or four quarters, um, and you just add it up and you accumulate these quarters of coverage like little tokens. Um, and they sit in your, your Social Security personnel file, and uh, uh, hopefully you rack up enough of them so that when you do need benefits, you have enough quarters of coverage in the bank uh, to make you eligible. Now, the number of quarters of coverage that you need for disability insurance is not just the 40 that you have for old age, because you know, people get disabled at different points in their life. They're not all 62 or older, which is how old you have to be to get Social Security old age benefits. You could become disabled at like 25, for instance. And if you get disabled at 25, you could, ne you could never have accumulated 40 quarters of coverage by that point because that would have been 10 years. What are you working since you were 15? That's, you know, like that's not uh, realistic. So the basic rule on this is you need at least six quarters of coverage, right? You need at least six of them. So remember, you get one quarter of coverage if you earn that much in a year. If you earn four times that in one year, you would get four quarters of coverage. And then in the next year, if you earn two times that, you could get two quarters of coverage. So you got to rack up at least six quarters of coverage. From there, the amount that you need to be eligible is equal to one quarter of coverage for every calendar year after you turn 21. So you gotta have at least six, and then you have to have one at, at, at least one since the age of 21, right? So at least six plus at least one since you turned 21. You gotta hit both of those, you know, both of those uh, check marks in order to be eligible for SSDI. Um, and at, at the point at which you've gotten, uh, you know, you're, you're some 40, at the point at which you've gotten 40, you're good, right? So then you don't even have to worry about the minimum anymore, obviously, because you've already got 40. You don't need to worry about having at least one since you turned 21. If you get to 40, you're good. If you're less than 40, you have to have at least six plus one for every year after age 21. Um, 
So, yeah, that's how you become eligible for SSDI. The other funny thing about SSDI is, uh, why? that's not funny, but, you know, in theory, the way the Social Security is supposed to work is you become eligible for old age benefits or disability benefits or whatever, and then you also can get Medicare, right? So you kind of, you get both things. You get money and you get health care, right? And money plus with the money, you can buy stuff with the health care. You can go to the doctor. Oh, that's, you know... I don't know. It, it's a nice little package in theory, but for disabled people who get on SSDI, you're eligible for Medicare, but only after a 24-month qualifying period. So if you have to wait two years after you get on SSDI to get health insurance. Um, and disabled people often have health needs, you know, so... It's not a it's, it's it's kind of a head scratching thing. In the last uh, presidential election, of course, many of the candidates pledged to get rid of this twenty four month waiting period, um, and you know no traction since then. So, yeah, so it's not even a free ride. Even if you get on SSDI, the better of the two, it's not. Uh, it's uh, you you're still stuck without insurance. I assume in this case you would get Medicaid. Um, from your state, depending on your state, if they've expanded it. I love this bit here. Actually, this is on the, <laughs> during this qualifying per period for Medicare, the beneficiary may be eligible for health insurance through a formal former employer. How? No fucking way. <laughs> there's no fucking way. I mean, maybe there's some oddball, you know, employer here or there or state employer, but there's no, there's no way like your average employer is somehow providing health insurance for two years after someone has left due to a, a work limiting disability. That's a fucking ridiculous. But, you know, I guess that's what we tell ourselves to feel better about this. Um, so, yeah, so that's SSDI, but you are really asking about SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. So, you know, basically, if you don't have these quarters of coverage, you're going to have to get on SSI. And this is especially going to be you know, the case for people who are disabled from birth, right? Some people, you know, it's not like, well, I was working for 20 years and I threw my back out. Some people just have really quite severe disabilities in childhood that they carry over into adulthood and they're never able to work. Um, and so that's where you're going to see a lot of people who are on SSI. Now, before I get into the specifics of the SSI rules that you're talking about, I want to run a little bit of history for you here. Um, so everyone knows about welfare reform in 1996, right? Clinton passed the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, something like that. And we call it welfare reform. Now, people usually think that welfare reform was just when we essentially eliminated aid to families with dependent children, which was this welfare program that provided money to very poor single mothers. Um, but that's not the only thing that happened in that bill. The other thing that they did is they radically cut supplemental security income, SSI. Um, and one of the ways that they did this was, you know, prior to welfare reform, if you were disabled enough to be on SSI as like a 10-year-old, you know, every year you would get re-upped you know, and you, you'd still be on SSI, assuming your parents' income was within the right range. And then when you became an adult, it was fairly easy for you at that point to just say, look, I've, I've been disabled for many years now. I've uh, been on SSI. Uh, you, when you try to get on one of these programs, you have to go to something called the Disability Determination Services. So the government has, has declared that you are disabled beyond a certain threshold, right? So you just kind of go from children's SSI to adult SSI. You just, they just sort of move you over there, right? Well, they decided that's a fucking problem, I guess, in, in the welfare reform. And they started making it real hard, not only for, for kids to be on SSI, but if you were a kid who was on SSI, when you became an adult, they were going to kick you off. And what was interesting about this was, you know, it was in the bill that this was going to happen, sort of, but the way this works is the executive, the, the, you know, the Social Security Administration has to write a rule, ultimately, about how they're going to implement 
these cuts, right? So the statute kind of gives a general outline of it, but then it's really up to the Clinton administration to decide how hard are they going to be on disabled kids, right? How, how much are they going to cut? And the disability advocates really push them to say, hey, hey, please, please don't write like a really tough rule on this. You know, it's really... It, the, the ball's in your court, you know, it's maybe you could say before you had to sign a bill because it was the best you could do with a Republican, con whatever, the shit you usually say, you have total control over what the rule is going to say. So please do, don't make this a harsh rule that's kicking all these kids off of SSI. Um, and the Clinton administration, cold-blooded. Today, this was, what's the date on this? February 7th, 1997. The Clinton administration today issued rules that it said would end disability benefits for 135,000 poor children, 14% of all children who now receive those benefits under the Supplemental Security Income Program. The new rules would also deny benefits to 45,000 disabled children who are not now on the rolls but would otherwise have qualified for assistance in the next five years, right? Um, now, it's important to note, to get SSI, to get SSI, you have to be poor. There's an income test, which we'll get into before, so we'll get into later. So these kids are, their parents are already very poor, or they wouldn't be eligible. They'd fail the income test and they wouldn't be able to get SSI. So they, <laughs> they're specifically going not just after disabled kids, who they basically say are not that disabled, um, but disabled kids whose parents are very poor and they just, just boot them off. And they didn't have to do it. They could have written the rules however they wanted to write them and they just decided to go for it. Um, I love these. I've I, I've uh, I love these articles about welfare reform. If you ever have time to to read like everything the New York Times wrote about them uh, implementing this stuff, it's really fucking gruesome. Um, anyways, we get some good we get some good bits here. Um, <laughs> Advocates for the disabled said the rules were more restrictive than necessary, um, but administrative administration officials said even more disabled children would have lost benefits under early versions of the welfare legislation that were vetoed by Mr. Clinton. It could have been worse. What a what a fake counter that is. Um, you are writing the rule to be like, well, my rule is not as bad as other legislation that didn't pass. It's irrelevant. You're writing the rule. What, what comparison does that? It, why would we compare your rule to some bill that didn't pass? And then that's supposed to make us feel good about it. It's fucking absurd. Anyways, here's a real money, the real money shot that I love from this article. Susan M. Daniels an associate commissioner of Social Security, said the new rules would save the federal government $4.8 billion over five years. Read less than a billion a year. Um, average benefits for children, 424 a month. Man, just fucking scraping, man. That's just too much for poor disabled kids. Oh, right? She continues, most of the children being denied benefits have mental impairments or behavioral problems. Ms. Daniels said they had more mild or less severe impairments. It's really a matter of degree, she said. Social Security officials gave examples of how the new rules would affect various children. A child with attention deficit disorder with a verbal IQ score of 75 or with swollen wrists resulting from rheumatoid arthritis will probably lose benefits, they said. In contrast, children with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, or autism may still qualify, as will children with diabetes requiring insulin shots three times a day. But officials said each case would be evaluated carefully. We don't wanna, I don't want to promise too much, but I think if you got, if you got the cerebral palsy, I think we can keep you on. You know, it's going to be case by case, but I think we can keep you on. Rheumatoid arthritis. 75 IQ, man, you're going to have to move off a little bit, you know? <laughs> Again, these people are poor. It's not just like everyone who has rheumatoid arthritis. The, the kids are poor and have a disability, even if it's mild, I guess. Um, they're not having that anymore. Anyways, in addition to kicking all these kids off, like I said, um, they also made it to where 
Uh, you know, at the point at which you turn 18, if you were on SSI, they're going to really fucking give you a hard look. And and really, they're basically given the green light to say, start kicking these kids off when they turn into adults. And let's see what happens. All right. Well, let's see what happens, actually. We want to see what happens. Let's see what happens. So we have this paper uh, from uh, not too long ago, um, University of Chicago, Deshpande. Does welfare inhibit success, the long-term effects of removing low-income youth from the disability roles? So what's cool about this paper is because of the way the legislation worked, um, children, as he says right here, let me bump this up. Children who turned 18 after August 22nd, 1996, would need to get a medical review at the age of 18 to determine if they could continue receiving benefits. So we get this nice little um, kind of natural experiment here because if you turned 18 before the welfare reform hit, you didn't get this hard look where... I call it a hard look. It's really just like kicking people off the rolls for no good reasons. If you turn 18 before then, it was easy to get on SSI as an adult. If you turned 18 after that date, it was really hard to get on SSI as an adult. So we can compare the P. There's a discontinuity there, right? At that point in time, we can compare the kids right before that time, right before that date, to the kids right after that date and see what happens. What happens when you kind of just willy-nilly bump kids off of SSI when they turn 18? And what he finds here is pretty gruesome. Um, the kids who are removed from SSI when they turn 18 um, after welfare reform, they earn on average just $4,400 a year. Right? If they had stayed on SSI, they would have gotten three times that much from SSI. Right? So, roughly speaking, we're taking these people who are getting 12000 a year on SSI, we're kicking them off the rolls on the theory that these people aren't really that disabled. You know, we checked them. Yeah, they were disabled enough as a kid, but now they're an adult. We think that they can go work. And we don't want to be wasting 12000 a year on them, right? So we take the 12000 from them, say, go out and work, and they're only able to go out on average and get 4400 from the labor market. Fucking brutal. 12000 is not a lot of money. Even in you know, 1990, that's not a lot of money. Um, that would put you, put you in, at or near poverty for a single adult for sure. Um, they're only able to get 4400 from the labor market. <laughs> just, I mean, I don't know. That, to me, is just really, really sick. There's something very sick about kicking all these kids off, saying you're not disabled, and then they, they are. They actually were disabled. They actually, I mean, you know, some of them managed to get some money out of the labor market, but, like, fucking almost nothing. Almost nothing. The other thing, um, what else? Oh, there were other interesting aspects to this. So he also looked to see what happens if the um, parents, what happens to the parents of these kids, right? So there's one idea that, uh, well, maybe the parents will work more when they see their kid kicked off of SSI and like just struggle and suffer because they can't make really hardly any money working. Uh, maybe the parents will, will pick it up and start working more. No. No in, in income effects on parents, right? Parents didn't increase earned or unearned income, right? So they got no other thing to fall back on. Um, and the other interesting thing is he finds that removing 18-year-olds from SSI causes their younger siblings to have substantially lower earnings in adulthood. Although I don't have data on channels, one possible explanation for this effect on younger siblings is that the 18-year-old's SSI income pays for basic household needs, right? So, of course, right, this 18-year-old, they're not actually leaving the house because they're quite disabled, right? So before, their 12000 could come into the family unit and help everyone in the family, including their younger sibling. Now, they're quite disabled but have nothing 
right? Or they have on average $4,400 of labor earnings, right? Instead of the 12,000 from SSI. They lose eight grand of income and that actually has spillover effects on their younger siblings um, because that comes out of the family. They're dealing, you know, I mean, it just makes things a lot harder and those younger siblings end up taking a hit and they earn less, right? So it's not even that, hey, they didn't, you know, it wasn't great because they didn't go out and earn very much, but you're actually reducing the earnings of the, uh, like if you, if you want to promote work, in other words, this is not working because the younger siblings' ability to work is being harmed by the fact that they have a very poor, disabled, you know, adult sibling in the household who has no disability benefits anymore, huge burden on the parents and whatever. And I, I burden's the wrong word. I don't mean that, you know, in a, in a, financially it's a huge burden that the welfare state used to pick up and now it doesn't and that has negative spillover effects on the siblings, which reduces work for them. Anyways, so, so, so supplemental security income, how much do you get? I, I think now it's up to like $840, something like that. That's the maximum amount you can get, by the way, $840 a month, um, which is below the poverty line, quite a bit below the poverty line for a single, a single adult. Um, anyways, supplemental security income, SSI has an income test and an asset test. The basic gist here is they're going to take your income and uh, there's like some exemptions. So the first $20 of income you receive each month is not counted towards your income. The first $65 of earnings and one half of earnings over $65 received in a month is not counted as income and like a few other things here. Uh, but basically what they're going to do is after, um, you know, after knocking out some of these exemptions where you're not, your income's not counted against you, they're going to take your countable income um, and they're just going to subtract it basically dollar for dollar from your benefit. If it's earned income, it'll be 50 cents on the dollar from your benefit. Um and so, you know, whether you want to call it a 100% uh, effective marginal tax rate for unearned income and then a 50% effective marginal tax rate for earned income, um, they, they claw, like your benefits just decline super rapidly uh, if you go out and try to earn any income uh, while being on SSI. Um, and your, your countable income will include the income from your spouse as well. Um, See so your chapter on living living arrangements. Um, so, yeah, we could go on and on here, but if you live in, a, in other people's houses, if you, if you live with your um, spouse or whatever, their income is going to be counted against, against you. So that was what the commenter was asking, um, was whether or not you could get married and lose your disability benefit because of it. Absolutely, you can. If your spouse has money, earns income, you're going to lose this benefit. Um, so, seems bad to me. You know, one obvious way to fix this is is to not bring in family income. Like, if you want to keep the income test, which I don't think is a good idea, but uh, if you want, well, I will put that aside. If you want to have an income test, just individualize it. Because with SSDI, it doesn't work like that. With SSDI, there are limits on how much you can earn on SSDI because to be eligible for these benefits, you're supposed to have a work-limiting disability. So, you know, <laughs> it's weird to say I have a work-limiting disability and then go out and earn like $50,000, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, it kind of makes sense that as part of implementing disability benefits, you do have to kind of say, well, look, if you're able to earn over a certain amount, then you don't really have the kind of work limitation that we uh, want, need you to have. But it doesn't make sense to bring in your spouse's income for, for that purpose. Um, in SSDI, they don't bring in your spouse's income for that purpose, for, but for SSI, they do. And so that's where marrying can cause you to lose these benefits, um, even cohabiting potentially. Um, what else? All right. So then the other thing is the asset test. This one is even, even worse. Um, and this one was also mentioned by the commenter. Um, I think they technically call this a resource test, um, but it, it usually would be called an asset test in welfare, uh, state, uh, literature, but 
To get SSI, your countable resources must not be worth more than $2,000 for an individual or $3,000 for a couple. We call this the resource limit. So income, of course, is a flow. It's how much money you're getting each month or each year or whatever. And then this resource test or asset test is, is wealth. How much do you own? You can't have more than $2,000 of wealth. Now, again, uh, they don't count everything towards the asset test. So your home value is not counted. You can have one car that, that's not counted. Um, only one, though. <laughs> so don't get two. If, you are your, if your spouse has a car and you have a car, that second car is going to be counted towards uh, your asset limit. And cars are generally worth more than $2,000. So, you know, if your spouse already, uh, you know, might... <laughs> If your spouse has a car and you have a car and you marry, you could lose your SSI, even if you're otherwise like just dirt poor. Um, they don't count your furniture. That's nice. Uh, burial funds, um, shit like that. But other than that, they count it. So, I mean, for the most part, if you've got like $2,000 in a bank account, you are going to lose your SSI. Um, and people do it all the time. And, I'll give you a little. I'll give you a little insight into the dark, the dark world of SSI. But uh, obviously, people try to get around this in various ways. Um, and one, I don't know how common it is, but I've seen it. Uh, is you know, people basically have these bank accounts that some is in that are in someone else's name. These like straw bank accounts, just because they want to be able to have more than two thousand dollars in their bank account. So like your friend or whatever might have a bank account. It's all in their name and you're kind of just trusting them to like work with you and not steal the money from you because if they wanted to steal the money from you, they could. Uh, there's nothing you could do about it. What are you going to complain? Say, oh, I was doing SSI fraud and, uh, <laughs> you know, you're you... so that's not a great arrangement either, but people do it. Um, but yeah, you know, you get over 2000, you lose all of the benefit. All right. It's not like with the income test where you lose it dollar for dollar or maybe 50 cents on the dollar for every dollar of income. It's just a straight cliff. You get up to, you put that $2,000 in your bank account, boom, your disability benefits are gone. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about something. So periodically people talk about increasing this limit, the asset limit. I have a paper where I say just get rid of it. Uh, weirdly, the disability advocates, well, I don't know if it's weird. It's the same shit that happens over and over again with the policy stuff, which if you followed me, you probably know my take on this. But the people who are like the advocates, they always like propose something that's real weak and, and bullshit. So I think like the prevailing policy proposal at the, at the moment is what if we increase the $2,000 limit to like $5,000 or $10,000 or something? Um, and of course I just say, why don't you just eliminate it? And they're like, well, Matt, you know, that's, that's never going to pass. You know, you can't just eliminate it. That's just not politically, it's not doable. And then I go, well, did your fucking bill pass? No. Okay. So I mean, what's, what's the difference at the end of the day? At least I have a good proposal. Um, Anyways, so periodically, of course, people uh, will say that's that's not really good. So uh, actually, let me take a step back. So imagine you are a parent uh, and you have a disabled child and, you know, they grow up to be a disabled adult and you're able to get them on SSI uh, or maybe not, depending on how the resources are counted for them. Um, but you see yourself... Um, Death comes for all of us, I guess, is uh, maybe the most abrupt way to put it. So you're aging. You know, you're, you're getting up to 50 years old, let's say 60 years old, and you have a very, you know, severely disabled adult child, and you've been taking care of them their whole life. They're maybe 30, 40 years old. You're getting up to 50, 60, 70, and you realize, um, I'm going to die. And then my disabled uh, adult child... I don't, uh, what's, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, and you can then say, oh, well, they can get on SSI. But you're like, uh, 
Yeah, no. So SSI means that they live in like severe, like very significant poverty because the maximum benefit on SSI is below the poverty line. So that's not really reassuring. I'm not really reassured by the idea that I'm going to die and then my very disabled adult child is going uh, to have to live on this program. Um, they might have like a severe intellectual disability. There might be all sorts of problems with that. So you say, um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be really diligent and I'm just going to save, 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 save. I really want to put away money just, you know, so when I die, they, they can rely on that, you know, and, and they could pay for caregivers and all the rest of this, right? And the problem that you run into is you're like, well, if you save all that money uh, and then you sort of uh, give it to them upon death, uh, then they fail the asset test in SSI and they're not eligible for this program. And often if they're not eligible for this program, they're also not eligible for Medicaid. And Medicaid's where you're going to get your long-term uh, support and services, your, your home caregivers and stuff like that, which can be insanely expensive. So saving up to deal with the eventuality of your death ends up just completely screwing your kid um, because they can't get into these programs. And of course, not doing it also puts them in a really rough spot. Um, and so you might think, hey, well, that's a, great, that's a great case for just getting rid of the asset test. Just don't do the asset test. Fucking easy. Oh, no, that would be too damn simple, right? So instead, <laughs> they created this back in 2014. It's called the Achieving a Better Life Experience. Uh, they're called, uh, well, the, the bill was Achieving a Better Life Experience Act. And then we have the accounts, which are called ABLE accounts. Um, and, you know, you know what this was going to be the answer, right? A tax-free saving account that's uh, going to be immune from the SSI asset test, right? That's what it's going to be because it's just going to be an account. It's just like we do 529s or, or FSAs or HSAs or 401ks or RRAs, everything. You could just do an account. Who knows? I don't even know. Can you, can you invest these accounts? Can you put this in the fucking S&P 500? Who knows? Um, but you do these accounts... And you can kind of save up for your kid this way so that when you die, they get this account and it doesn't uh, keep them from getting SOS, uh, from SSI or Medicaid. Um, but only if you're sophisticated enough to do this account. And yeah, of course, if you don't have money, you know, whatever, then, 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 it, then it doesn't even matter. But um, I've yet to see a good uh, rundown on is this shit working. I imagine it's a train wreck like anything else. Like maybe if a handful of affluent uh, people who have very good financial planners and stuff like that who even know that this exists have figured out how to take advantage of it. But um, I suspect uh, uh, many more have not figured out uh, how to take advantage of it. Um, but yeah, you can save as much as a hundred grand into this account. Um, and, and then we can, we've solved our problem. Um, now if you don't solve that problem, uh, periodically, uh, just to, you know, if you, if you weren't depressed enough by the kids, this story here, periodically we get stories. I mean, uh, apparently hundreds of these stories, uh, where aging parents with adult disabled kids, um, you know, they get up to 80, 90 and, they're looking down the barrel of, I can't take care of my child anymore. The welfare state's got nothing for them, right? It's got this SSI shit, which is almost nothing. And if I give them money, like that's not really going to work. And they just fucking kill their kid and kill themselves, which is fucking, un you know, I, you know, I'm not going to make any excuse for that. And that's not acceptable, right? Obviously on any level. Um, but it's the welfare state that pushes them to do this, right? So we got this example here, 82-year-old man killed 82-year-old wife and um, his two disabled uh, adult uh, kids who had, um, who were like severely autistic and had other kinds of disabilities. Um, and occasionally they'll even leave notes. I couldn't find the one with the notes, but I read these stories when they come out and they'll just say, look, I, 
I felt like this was the best thing I could do. Um, and again, I don't want to play into that and say that's sympathetic because the disability advocates get very mad at that, um, and for good reason. Um, but you got to recognize that it's the it's fucking SSI that's killing these people. It's SSI that's putting these people in this impossible, crazy situation where occasionally they um, they reach that conclusion. Um, so. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Um, now, as far as solutions go, you know, there's a couple of approaches uh, to disability. I've never done like a full-blown disability uh, like paper, but I did talk about it in this paper, Cleaning Up the Welfare State. The long story short is I think um, SSI should be eliminated, and instead we should just have SSDI. But SSDI, the rules should be an SSDI if you... There should be a minimum benefit equal to the poverty line or one and a half times the poverty line or whatever. And every person who's disabled and like passes the disability screen or whatever should be at least eligible for that minimum benefit, right? And that minimum benefit will be treated like the other benefits in, in SSDI. So there won't be an asset test. There won't be an income test. Well, there'll be like an earnings test because it is work limiting, but um, your spouse's income won't come in. Um, so it would be in a treated like SSDI, and that would solve a lot of the problems that the commenter mentioned about, well, if you get married, don't you lose your benefits, and if your spouse wants to work, yeah, that's all true right now, but if you put them on SSDI on a, on a nice minimum benefit, that wouldn't be true anymore, because SSDI doesn't have an asset test and doesn't count um, the income from your spouse uh, against you. Um, and then the other thing is to, you know, expand the supply of and, and of course, public subsidy for long term services and support in home caregivers, things like that. Um, and, and, and of course, eliminate the two year waiting period for Medicare, <laughs> which I talked about earlier. Right. So if you put those three together, then what do you have? You have a, a program where people uh, who have these work limiting disabilities will at least get a decent minimum income, cash income. They will uh, have access to caregivers if they need through uh, long-term services and support. This is typically done uh, through Medicaid right now, um, but there are waiting lists and there's limited funds and whatever, right? So they'll get their money, they'll get their caregivers, and they'll get their health insurance. And you put that together, no one's saying it's uh, it's a it's a glamorous existence uh, necessarily, but it's it's a it's a decent existence potentially. Um, and it's not like that would break the bank or anything like that. It's just uh, they just don't do it. They don't. People don't give a fuck. Um, I guess you know. It's just, it's, I I can never really understand why we don't do a decent welfare state. Um, you know, beyond just sort of people who are who have these really cruel and ridiculous ideologies um, against it. So. There you have it, uh, basics of the disability benefit system in the U.S., quite a train wreck, um, and it just, it's awful. It causes a, just unbelievable, unbelievable problems. Um, occasionally, you know, not to go on too long here, but occasionally you'll have uh, people who are on SSI who become kind of, um, you know, they're very important advocates you know, um, for disability benefits and stuff like that. And they start getting to the point where, you know, they're very eloquent, they write things, they might give speeches and things like that. And they become a bit kind of like in demand, if you will, like publications want uh, them to write for them occasionally, like on a freelance basis, not on a permanent role. Um, and they might be invited to do a speech somewhere and then they could get maybe paid speaking fees and things like that. And frequently those people in that situation, which obviously is a very unique one, they have to like decline the money because if they lose their benefits, they will lose, in most cases, they're mostly worried about losing Medicaid, which is their health insurance, because if they lose Medicaid, then they won't be eligible for a caregiver. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... It's not good. It's not good. Uh, and, and it could be cleaned up fairly easily. Um, and, and people just don't do it. You get promises every campaign cycle for, uh, for president to, to do something on this, and they just don't. 
They just don't. It's been this way for a long time. And, uh, you know, the even, even post-90s, even all this cruel shit in the 90s, right, where we saw this shit happen. Um, we've got studies on what happened. We know it didn't work. You could at least let people roll over onto SSI more easily now when they become an adult, go back to how it was so we don't have this shit. We can't even get that done. No one cares. So, anyways, like, subscribe, click the bell, all that stuff, and uh, leave some more comments, and uh, I'll make some more videos.